Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Discomfort Zone Podcast. The idea to cross the ape man with the Anunnaki. Slaves work animals created for one person to avert the gods. Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining me for another episode brand new of the Discomfort Zone podcast. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Let me know if it's okay with the sound. I might have some issues here. I can hear a slight echo. But let me know how it sounds. Nonetheless, we'll start. Welcome. Welcome to the chat. Normuk, I don't think I've uh, seen you here before. Thank you for joining. Patient Zero, Rondon, Revise Sociology. So good to have you uh, so near, both in chat and uh, here. It's a bit quiet. Okay, is that a bit better? Let me see. I think I uh, might have changed something in the settings. Yeah, it does sound a bit different. Hang on. How does that sound? Oh, has that fixed it? I think that sounds a bit better. Sorry about that. We we can't really start an episode without, you know, some some technical impedance of one kind or another. But we're here nonetheless, and we shall uh, continue as we always do, because we have a very, uh, a very, well... I always say it's a special episode and I always say there's a lot to get through. But I was thinking of trying to do something a little different this time. I felt that last week, um, well, and in general, as we've been talking about it, we do get through quite a lot. And I think if people are quite well versed with the in the information and know what I'm talking about already, then that should be okay. But I thought this week we might be able to try to delve just a little bit deeper into uh, the subject, narrow our scope just a little bit um, so that we can really focus and understand. And partially the reason is that this week's subject is a little more, um, well, I wouldn't say it's complex, but perhaps it's a little uh, sort of harder to perceive, especially without uh, visual aid of some kind, as we don't always have here. I do have some pictures for chat and for the uh, for the video uh, streaming for those who are watching, but I do want it to be accessible to those who are only listening as well. Oh, welcome, All Indigo, All Indigo, yes, and Cryptopi something, the, the Creepy Pauper. Welcome, welcome both, thank you very much, you're just in time. So, without further ado, let's get started, and for those who are here for the last episode, I mentioned that we're going to be talking about The Procession of the Equinox. Now, the Procession of the Equinox is a subject which is uh, is rather interesting because it manages to bridge that uh, gap between astronomy and astrology. And we've spoken before about the differences and the connections, and uh, there are some subjects that are very much distinct with each. There are some subjects that overlap, but the Procession of the Equinox is certainly an interesting one since it has a very different meaning for each of the uh, different uh, fields of study. So the procession of the equinox is definitely an astronomical uh, event, and we're going to understand a little bit what it means and what we're talking about, and then we're going to go into the um, spiritual meaning and implications of what we actually can do with this information, according to Drumvelo, of course. So let's get started. Now... As we know, with astronomy, we're dealing with a different level of uh, scale, basically. And so we have our planet, planet Earth, and we have our moon, and we exist inside our solar system, which is the planets that are uh, circling our sun. And then we have uh, other solar systems inside our galaxy, and we have neighboring galaxies inside our universe, and that's more or less the designations that we that we know and we talk about. Now, within that, we also have sort of different time scales because there is a relationship between this space, the uh, the size of the motion, and the time that it takes. And so we have, let's say, our twenty four cycle, which re- uh, twenty four hour cycle, which relates to the Earth spinning around itself, spinning around its axis. And we have the, you know, 365 days, the yearly cycle around the sun, which as we all know is the amount of time it takes us to orbit it. And the procession of the equinox is simply another measurement of time. 
And the reason it's a little bit uh, harder to visualize and understand in the beginning is that it's not as simple as simply the Earth rotating around itself or uh, rotating around the Sun, but it's a certain wobble. And this is the term <laughs> that's used. And uh, that's, the word, that's the one that we're going to stick with. It's, uh, it's a confusing, I think, word because it sounds very unscientific. But if you were to imagine it, it's actually very, very similar to what a... A gyroscope, a spinning top, starts doing when it sort of starts losing momentum. It starts uh, going round in circles, but it's sort of wobbling a bit off its center axis. When it's spinning at high velocity, it stays completely straight. And that's really what the Earth is doing, uh, in a way. So let's try and visualize this. In fact, um, I have a picture here that I'm going to upload to chat while we're talking. Let me see that I get the right one. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and imagine that the Earth has the axis um, sticking out of it. Now, as, uh, as I hope uh, some of you know, the Earth is actually on a certain uh, tilt versus the Sun. And it's not sort of exactly um, opposite, exactly, uh, uh, not equilateral, what's the term? Perpendicular to the Earth's rays, as it were. But in fact, it's uh, at a slight angle. And this angle is what gives us the four seasons that we know. So we can see that if we draw a certain line through the center of the Earth, that that line wouldn't be exactly perpendicular. It would be slightly tilted. Now, that tilt is really where the poles, the magnetic poles of the Earth, the north and south poles are. If you imagine the top end of it as it were <laughs> flat earth confirmed absolutely <laughs> well flat earth inside a sphere ah you see that's the real secret nobody talks about is that the flat earth is contained in a sphere no i'm joking but um, if we imagine that the earth's axis um the top part is the north pole and the bottom part is the south pole now if this was the axis then we can imagine that that sort of pole is pointing to the north and in fact it's pointing to what we call the north star the thing about the procession is that this axis this uh, angle that it's that the poles are at is actually not constant and it changes very very slightly in fact it if we were imagining that those uh, ends of the axis where we see those two balls those ends are sort of drawing a circle because they're moving uh, in that sort of wobbly shape, so the top axis is um, the top part of the axis is drawing a circle, and the bottom part is drawing sort of the circle on the opposite side. Then the um, completion of one cycle of those circles is around twenty six thousand years, and the exact figure that's that's considered is hard to uh, say. It's sort of is slightly debatable. Uh, Drumvillo mentions 25,900. Uh, most of the scientific academia uh, s estimate around 25,700, but it's between 25 and a half and 26,000 years. So we'll call it 26 for simplicity. And each uh, on, on that circle, if we imagine that cycle that it's going through, it passes one degree of that cycle every 72 years again approximately more or less so i hope everyone is more or less imagining that especially those who are listening we have the earth at a slight tilt and this is the tilt that gives us the seasons and then that tilt the angle that it's at in comparison to the sun is changing ever so slightly and it draws this sort of complete circle and returns as it were to where it started every 26,000 years okay I think that's pretty good of the air. Uh, oh, let's see if there's anything in chat. Okay. Um, okay, the angle of the Earth's obliquity cycles between 21 and 24 degrees. Ah, yes. This is this is actually another uh, shift, but we won't get into that right now. But yes, there are lots of different measurements, and it's, it's interesting to remember with all of these that the shifts in the um, angles and the different geometry is always related to the passage of time when it comes to the stars. Well, I don't know if always, but uh, a lot of them are drawn in order to be like uh, 
to, to regulate the passage of time. And indeed, a lot of the ancient traditions speak about um, this procession of the equinox, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, yes, the angle messes with summer. Of course, uh, if you like, well, I'm not sure if you'd call it summer, but you can always go to the tropics, which is where the equator is in the center of the earth, where the angle is least, uh, has the smallest effect. And there, uh, it's, it, it doesn't have four seasons. It has sort of two, a rainy and a dry season, but the temperature shift is very, very, very small. And obviously, as you go further away from it, it gets more extreme. So I'd suggest somewhere around the sort of, um, what do you call it, the zodiac equator, the Cancer equator, and the, uh, not Aries, I can't remember, but the two equators. And those are sort of very, I think, well, for me, I like the four uh, seasons. I like the changes. It's, uh, I, I didn't enjoy being in just this constant, sunny, warm sort of climate. But that's me. Nevertheless, um, what this means for us and the, the deeper meaning that we can take from this is something that Druvalo goes into a little bit. And before we touch on that um, side of things, I thought we'd talk about um, the perception of the procession of the equinoxes in a modern day astrology with the New Age uh, theories and indeed in uh, ancient times with um, various ancient civilizations. So as we've spoken about in the podcast before, um, there would be a very difficult question to answer, which is how could people, scholars of any kind, who live to be around or 80, 100 years, back then 30 years, how could they perceive and manage to document the changing in the stars that would occur over 26,000 years? That's many, many generations seeing very, very small uh, incremental changes over time. Obviously, after the calculations were made, whether they were by Newton um, once they could predict the placement of the stars more accurately, you can actually see where the stars have been and will be uh, however far into the past or the future you want. But back in those times, according to mainstream uh, you know, accepted science, the theory is that the ancient civilizations weren't uh, able to predict those exact placements yet. And indeed, we see that some people were talking about the uh, sun rotating around the earth. So if that is the case, why why does the, I mean, ancient civilizations speak about the procession of the equinox and indeed have many uh, religious um, ceremonies surrounding it, and yet their maths and their sciences don't seem to be able to comprehend it, don't seem to back it up. So this seems to be once again one of those instances where humanity was given a little help in terms of the knowledge. And if we would imagine a race of uh, astronauts, um, extraterrestrials who were expert, you know, uh, navigators of space and the solar system and had conquered interplanetary uh, travel, then we might be able to imagine beings who would have this kind of uh, information. So, uh, oh, anti clummy blood, welcome, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. I, we've missed you the last few uh, episodes. And I should say, Crimson Clad, thank you for joining us as well. And Alien Honey, welcome, one and all. Um, so that's slightly beside the point, but what we need to learn or what we need to remember, as it were, is that these ancient civilizations were talking about these very, very long uh, time cycles. And one of the most famous, probably, ancient civilizations who spoke about it were indeed uh, the Maya. And the Maya had a special name for this uh, cycle of the procession, this entire orbit that takes 26,000 years, was called a great year in their terminology. Now, we won't get into Mayan astrology because it's a vast subject and I actually don't know that much about it. Um, it's a very ingenious methodology and the way that it works, it's got sort of two uh, cycles that um, interconnect and so the relation between them draws another new cycle and that new greater cycle is the, uh, the great year. And so within the great year, they have these two 
uh, overlapping cycles which aren't equal. I can't remember exactly, that's why I'm not saying, but it's the small year and something else. I can't remember the terms exactly. But anyway, for all in our intents and purposes, all we need to know is that the Mayans considered the great year a very important cycle. And within that cycle, it marks uh, great changes that can come, that will come to Earth and to uh, the humans that inhabit it. And this is really where Drunvalo um, picks up, as it were. And he speaks about the importance of the uh, procession of the equinox in relation to human consciousness. So let me just have a look and see. Um, I have another picture here, and we're going to try and uh, upload that while I talk as well. So within this uh, image of the procession of the equinox, we've spoken about Earth, and we've spoken about uh, the wobble of the axis, but that is only in relation, as it were, to the Sun. What we need to do to understand this is put it in relation to uh, the galaxy. And so with this picture that we've seen that I've uh, uploaded here, what we see is that the Earth is sort of a, a vantage point and surrounding us is the um, sort of this, the circle of the different um, zodiac houses. And so we've spoken about astrology a little bit. We've spoken about the effect of the um, close planets to us. But here we're talking about another side of astrology. And this is where looking up at the night sky, we can see the different houses, um, what we know as the uh, star signs. But we can see the different houses in the stars that are uh, going around, that are moving in the night sky. And so if we imagine the Earth in the center and all around us is the circle of the zodiac, then wherever we look, we can see uh, a certain um, zodiac house that the axis falls onto. So let me just say that one more time because uh, it's a bit hard to imagine if you can't see it. The Earth is in the center and the axis, uh, the axis is sort of pointing in one of the directions of the circle, as it were. And so that direction is pointing towards one of the uh, zodiac houses. Uh, when I'm talking about the houses, I'm talking about the uh, Leo, Cancer, you know, all of the uh, different signs. Actually, let's just mention that very quickly. Um, when we speak about astrology, we usually, you know, ask someone what their, what their sign is, you know, uh, whatever it is, Capricorn, Aquarius. What we are asking with that question is where, um, in which house was the sun uh, at the time that you were born? And that means that the sun goes through this same circle that we see uh, in relation to the earth, obviously, um, every year. And so the 12 months relate to the 12 signs and every month the sun is in a different house. And so if you're born when the sun was in Aries, was in the house of Aries, your star, your star sign is Aries, okay? What we're talking about, uh, we have to remember that the zodiac and the 12 signs, that's not the only relation. There is a 12, um, sorry, a 24-hour cycle where the sun's path through the sky goes through the 12 houses, uh, one every two hours. And here we're talking about another cycle, which again is the much larger one, which is every 26,000 years, the Earth's axis revolves, completes one entire cycle of the zodiac. And so uh, it's, a, it's a different measurement, but we're still using the star sign names. So that's why it's important to sort of clear it up a little bit. Was that, was that, uh, did that make sense to you? Um, are we, do you mean in the year? or in sort of we're going to be talking about the age of aquarius and the age of uh, uh, the different ages but are you talking about the star sign of the month because yeah again when we're mentioning these we could be asking what time of day so for instance if now where i am it's actually 11 o'clock we're nearing 12 o'clock at 12 o'clock at midnight is um the center point the libra um the earth okay so you're talking about the procession of the equinox yeah so within that uh, the the 
Earth changes houses, as it were, the axis changes through houses every 2,000 years, 2,160 years, if I'm not mistaken. And so when we're talking about, when we hear the, the age of Aquarius and the age of Pisces and Christ and all these things, that's the cycle that we're talking about. We're talking about the axis, the procession of the equinox moving through uh, the zodiac houses and we're nearing the end of the past, the previous uh, 20, 2000, sorry, 2000 uh, years and entering uh, the age of Aquarius. If that it was your question, anti comic blood, was that your question? Because uh, it's it's a little confusing. We use a lot of the same terms for a lot of the different um, parts of the astrology, and indeed, there's there's two astrologies that we're talking about here. There's the sidereal astrology, and uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the other kind. Gosh, sidereal and equatorial. No. I'm sorry, I'll have to look it up afterwards. That was the question, excellent. Um, you wonder if the tilt changes ever so, every so many eons of years. Um, if you're talking about the, the, the wobble, that is the, the 26,000 years, but if you mean, generally speaking, whether there's a larger cycle, then there are other cycles. I don't know specifically about the, uh, the tilt changing. Tropical, thank you. Oh, how Patient Zero, at some point I'm going to have to have you on the show just to yeah, <laughs> pay my gratitude. Amazing, the tropical. Thank you. So yeah, let's 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 try and focus back in. Um, we're talking specifically about the uh, passage of the Earth's axis through the twelve zodiac uh, houses, which takes twenty six thousand years to complete, or uh, two thousand years to go through one house. And this brings us to another topic that, uh, <laughs> well, being good at Google is also very important. Um, this brings us to another topic. Now, in the picture that I've just uploaded, just before we uh, continue further, we can see at the top we have these sort of five stars. And right now, the Earth's axis is pointing to one of those stars, which we all know as the North Star, and is specifically Polaris. Now, Polaris is one of a group, I think it's five stars in total, it could actually be more, but a group of stars that are all called uh, the North Star at different times. And so if we imagine sort of the Earth's axis is the North Pole, and that North Pole points to different places in the sky as it wobbles. And so for each of those places, we have an approximation where at times it points exactly due north, and at times it's a few degrees off. Like now, I think Polaris is what, 14 degrees? No, that sounds a lot. I can't remember, but the, the north star is a few degrees off uh, exact north, and it will continue to move and shift and go all the way to the other end, uh, the other extreme, which is a star called Vega. And those mark the two end, point, end points, as it were, of the cycle. And then it continues round back towards Polaris to begin again. So the North Star that we know as the North Star is in fact only the North Star for uh, a, f a few thousand years, which is quite a long time as well. But it's not exactly according to the uh, houses. That's a little bit longer because there are fewer stars. There's no uh, 12, 12 stars. But nonetheless, it stays there and then it carries on. So within this, uh, oh, hi, Mariano, thank you for joining. Welcome, welcome back. Good to have you here. We're just talking about the procession of the equinox. And within that same cycle that we just saw with the stars, we could actually relate it even further. And we could say, uh, just for the sake of argument, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be mistaken about the sides, about which side is which, but if I'm not mistaken, Polaris the North Star that we're at now is the um, further away from the center of our galaxy. And Vega, the opposite side, is closer to the center of our galaxy. And so within this uh, wobble, there's actually another um, body that we need to be talking about, celestial body. And that is one of our neighboring solar systems. And funnily enough, we've actually mentioned that solar system once before, I believe a good few episodes ago when we were talking about ancient civilizations. I think that's when we spoke about the Dogon tribe, where there is an African tribe who are, you know, 
um, uh, not very advanced, shall I say, in terms of modern day technology, and yet they possessed uh, very, very advanced astronomical information, knowledge about this uh, neighboring solar system and the uh, sun that was on it, which was said to be the heaviest material in the world, which could be translated into the densest, the densest, which would make it a white dwarf. Uh, for those who don't know, every sun goes through a life cycle, starting as a sun the way that we know, and then it grows to a red giant, and then at times it can sort of implode and collapse in on itself and become a white dwarf, where it starts, uh, where it carries on imploding and becomes more and more dense. And that's the uh, densest, I believe, this may be outdated by now, but I believe that's the densest material that we have found in the universe. Um, that's actually what results in a black hole eventually, the end result of that crushing in on itself. But this, uh, the Dogon tribe, this uh, tribe in the middle of Africa who scientists suddenly came upon, were possessing this knowledge of the material and indeed the cycle which they said was 50 years and when scientists uh, worked it out uh, came out to be 49 and a half years so for those of you who remember i'm sorry for repeating for those who didn't know that was more or less the uh, interesting facts but what we're going to talk about now is the actual star system itself because it relates exactly to what we're talking about here um, there's a lot of stuff we are kept from knowing exists absolutely absolutely Oh, we'll be here. Um, so, we have a neighboring solar system, which is rather famous by now, called Sirius. And the Sirius solar system, well, that's a lot of S's, has two suns. Uh, one of them is a brighter star that we can actually see in our night sky. Um, I believe it's one of the brightest stars that can be seen. Um, and the other one is because it's not as bright, it can't actually be seen, and so it was hidden uh, for a long time. Not hidden, but uh, wasn't discovered until later. Um, and so these two uh, suns, these two stars, revolve around each other, orbit uh, each other, uh, in what's known as a binary star system. Now, this binary solar system, this binary star system, is important to us because it's one of the closest uh, solar systems to us and because of this it actually affects our solar system's uh, position and orbit as it were. So we've mentioned before we have as it were the moon uh, orbiting earth and then the earth and the moon orbiting the sun but the sun itself is also in orbit and we keep scaling up, the Sun is orbiting the next largest thing, which is our galaxy. And so our galaxy spirals, um, and that spiral is the motion, as it were, of the uh, solar systems orbiting the center of the galaxy. Now, equally to us, the Sirius solar system, well, I'm going to have an easy way of saying that, is also orbiting the uh, Galaxy. Yes, thank you, Ariano. Exactly. Ah, wonderful picture. And you can actually see that blue dot, which it looks bluer than the white, but <laughs> is actually the white dwarf. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure. Looks like the pictures that I've seen. And so this, the Sirius, uh, the star system, is actually orbiting the center of the galaxy as well. And since both of our solar systems are so close, they are actually... Um, not orbiting each other, but they ebb and flow sort of close and away from each other. They have this uh, elliptical um, motion where they go towards each other and then away from each other. And it's a very interesting mathematical geometric uh, pattern that they draw. But for our intents and purposes, it's not as important as understanding the role that this, uh, this motion plays in our humanity's consciousness. And this is really what Druvalo uh, is talking about when he mentions all of this and the reason he talks about all these things is how it affects us here on Earth. So if we imagine once again that the two polar ends of the, uh, the axis, the cycle, the orbit that the axis goes through, we can imagine one end being towards the center of our galaxy and the other end uh, being further away from it. 
Sorry, I made a promise to myself after listening last time that I have to occasionally drink, otherwise my voice gets so dry, it drives me insane. So I apologize. But this is really what it's all about. We can then translate, as it were, the orbit, the elliptical uh, path that the axis goes through as being a path that sort of uh, goes towards the center of the galaxy and then away from the center and returns. And this cycle of towards and away is 26,000 years. This, according to Druvalo, is what uh, dictates many of the great changes that happen uh, here on Earth. And so it's interesting that he wrote this book, I actually can't remember the exact year, 93, I believe, or 94 it was published. Um, and so it's been uh, a few decades since then. But um, we certainly seem to be in a very interesting time in the history of humanity. And the Mayans who calculated the great year calculated the end of the uh, procession, as it were, in 2012. However, that date um, is not necessarily accurate, and uh, we won't go into the comp competing theories of why or why not, but um, for our, oh, hang on, patience here, does the current chaos matches astrological predictions? Well, that's a very good question. You know what? Let's leave that question just for now. I'll finish this, and I will come right back to it, because I do want to answer that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an important question to talk about. But we're just going to finish this one point, which is that the um, this motion, according to Drungalo, along this cycle, is something that affects consciousness very greatly through changes that happen here on Earth. And we can sort of map them out on that uh, cycle. Okay? So let's... Oh, okay. You know what? Actually, I have... Okay, we're going to be talking about the uh, Indian Yugas next. So just before we get into that, that's actually a good time. Um, Patient Zero asks, does the current chaos matches astrological predictions? Which, on a larger scale, could be said, uh, have Grunvalo's predictions uh, come true? To which the easiest answer would be, it's hard to say. And I would, first of all, say that anyone who makes predictions and who makes uh, exact and accurate uh, predictions down to certain days or certain times is almost certainly doomed to fail. Uh, just statistically speaking, I've read and uh, known about many, many different predictions done throughout history. And if you look at the statistics, it seems that very, very few people, if any, have managed to get the date right. However, when it comes to predictions of sort of processes and changes in patterns and uh, different sort of, you know, zeitgeists that come, those predictions seem to be much more accurate at time. And indeed, they're not saved only for sort of astrological predictions, but very much a scientific predictions of one way or another uh, seem to be equally good. And so I think that it really depends on which of his predictions you ask. Um, I can't specifically remember the predictions that he said at this time, this is what's going to happen. Because Druvalo is very good, and that's part of why I like him. He always says, um, first of all, with any prediction, there's still free will. And the point about reality and existence and humanity is that things change. And whether, you know, if you're making a judgment based on what's now, you can't really predict what's going to happen. And the further away in future you get to, it gets harder and harder to predict. And so it, we'll get into some very, very deep stuff later. And Drunvalo talks a lot about, uh, about time travel and experiments and changes that were done on a fundamental level that sort of um, reverberate throughout time into the future and have these recurring uh, changes and a lot of very, very big stuff that really puts into perspective any kind of prediction. Um, I think you know, if we compare it, we can say the Earth or humanity is headed towards an ecological disaster. Now, whether that disaster is going to be that, you know, whatever it is, uh, um, there's no more clean water or the air gets polluted or a certain species takes over or a pandemic breaks out, it's hard to predict which of those. But you can see that the amount of tension and imbalance 
that is out there right now causing havoc is bound to end in that way. And so if the prediction is much more, I don't want to just say general because it's not just general, it's more, it's a different kind of prediction. It's a prediction of the pattern where I don't know the exact examples where that pattern will manifest, but I do know that that's the pattern that's going to manifest. And in that sense, yes, yeah, so far his predictions that I've read which many of them aren't his, he obviously relays them, but many of the predictions that he talks about are either um, from people or from books that he's read or, or different uh, cultures. So he doesn't do much of the predictions, certainly not astrological. He's not, he claims, he's not an astrologer. Um, this is all obviously part of sacred geometry and this is important for us to uh, understand how human consciousness works. And again, in relation to the Merkaba. But for now, um, let's continue. Okay, if Mercury keeps doing that retrograde thing, they say we line up. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Mercury will keep uh, doing that for sure, we hope. Um, so, now that we know a little bit about the precession of the equinox and what it means astronomically, we can start talking about the spiritual implications. And for those, Drumvalo introduces us to the Indian, that's uh, uh, Asian Indian um, culture where the uh, ancient scriptures spoke about these vast uh, timescales called yugas. Now, yugas have become, I think, very famous, specifically uh, Kali Yuga is probably the most famous that people have heard about. And once again, as we have with so many of these subjects, uh, there are many competing theories, and I wouldn't want to say which is correct, especially since I haven't actually read any of the original uh, yuga sort of scriptures or anything that talks about that. All of my information is through secondhand people who have interpreted it. And I'm aware of uh, the price of that, but I think that for our uh, purposes, that will be sufficient because we are, after all, studying Druvalo, and Druvalo is the one who brought us this information. And what he says is that the Indians have four different uh, time cycles, which uh, I'm going to go through their Indian names just because, you know, it's a, it's a sort of necessity, but there's no way that we need to actually uh, remember it. And so those are, whoop, whoop, let me have it here, the Satya Yuga, the Dvapara Yuga. Um, oh, hang on. Oh, sorry. The Satya Yuga, the Treta Yuga, the Dvapara Yuga, and the Kali Yuga. Forgive my uh, accent and pronunciation. Those are the four Yugas. And those four Yugas are divided into um, ascending and descending. And so we have eight points, right? Ascending and descending, four Yugas. And we place those um, on that circle. And in fact, for those who are... Uh, watching i'll be i'll put up that uh, image right now i'm gonna put oh wonderful who of course patient zero thank you yes so those are the yugas and you can see in fact the uh the relation of golden age silver bronze and iron um which are the uh the the, the indians you know one of their definition of the the four elements one of the divisions into uh you know oh sorry that's the wrong picture into uh, the four points of the cycle, right? The four that we've been talking about, the four from sacred geometry, this is another one of the instances where we can divide it into those four. And so this uh, division of the yugas that um, Patient Zero has uploaded is a certain division of uh, time scales. But we're going to be talking about that in relation to the procession of the equinox. And so we can see in the diagram, this is actually from Drumvalo's uh, book. This is the elliptical uh, ellipse that we were talking about. This is from the center of the galaxy away from Polaris to Vega, as it were. Okay. And so for those who are listening, what we see is an ellipse with two end points, one of them at the center of the galaxy and one away from the center. And then we have four um, points which are marked with letters. And they are the points immediately after those uh, those peaks, as it were. So one point after, immediately after the peak uh, away from the center, and one immediately after from the center. And then the other two are roughly in the middle from those two points. Uh, not exactly, but close to the middle. 
Okay, that's a <laughs> description for those who are listening. I hope you understand. But if not, it's not important. You'll understand the general idea nonetheless. What does this mean? Well, we can see that there are these awakening and falling asleep clues that can uh, let us know. Once again, we are not traveling along this ellipse. This is where the axis is pointing within the circle. Okay, so I want us to remember that because it looks very much like a solar system, like an orbit. This isn't actually moving. This is that wobble. But within that wobble, it points and shows uh, where we are, as it were, on that procession. And so the Indians said that the two points, the key points of interest, were actually not the peak, as it were, of the ellipse, the, uh, the end points of the ellipse, but immediately after. And those points immediately after are the points where great changes on Earth uh, usually occur. And so if we look, uh, well, at uh, Andrew Below's drawing, we have the peak that's away from the galaxy and immediately after that peak is where we are now what's uh, point a on the diagram 1990s but for us uh, 30 years forward is you know a very small amount within this 26,000 year cycle so we're immediately after the point where we are furthest away from the galaxy and so the traveling from the furthest point to the nearest point to the center of the galaxy is called waking up or awakening and then traveling from the center further away is called falling asleep and we can pretty much uh, both imagine what that means and understand the uh, logic behind it there is you know the center of the galaxy seems to be the focus and it's the focus on an energetic level which means that the impact that it has on the earth is uh, very much in relation to our level of consciousness and so we spoke a little bit last week about uh, the void and about these uh, different points and different periods where we can either lose memory lose ourselves etc uh, this point um, this is a, a, not the exact same void but these can be thought of in the same way we have this 26,000 year cycle where human consciousness um, in this cyclical form moves more to a higher consciousness and level of awareness and then falls to a lower one and continues in this cycle remembering of course that this cycle isn't a complete circle because it's not a flat plane but it's actually that spiral that we keep imagining where when you return to the beginning point the initial point you're not in exactly the same place okay um are we in this right now we are in ascending you uh treta i believe let me just let me just check that very very quickly because i have uh Druvalo's book here thankfully oh no we're technically in ascending dvapara which is before so yes 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 this is very confusing at the center of the galaxy so c and b are both satya and they're they're sort of parallel they're on top of each other then on, on the top and on the bottom is Treta. So the cycle goes Satya, Treta, Dvapara, Kali, and then Kali, Dvapara, Treta, Satya. So it doesn't go in the same cycle again, if that makes sense. You know what? I, uh, I'm i going to try and get this picture as well. It's a little tough because uh, I have to record it from my phone, but I'll do my best. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so is the implication that civilization is older than 26,000 years? Otherwise, what does this cycle apply to? Well, uh, how do you define civilization? If we define civilizations as many civilizations that rise and fall, then definitely certain civilizations won't last 26,000, in fact, probably most. Um, if we're talking about human civilization as, as, as an organized you know, uh, uh, culture, as an organism, etc., um, then yes, Druvalo is talking indeed about um, cultures and ancient uh, civilizations who were much older than, uh, than 26,000 years. And we will actually get into it because I, okay, this is a little off point, but I wanted to share this with you. How we do, okay, we're, we're pretty much okay on time because I think we've gone through the main parts. I was going over the book, obviously, for this and for the coming episodes, and I suddenly saw something that I had completely forgotten. 
um, as bizarre as that may sound, and that is that Druvalo actually mentions um, um, Sitchin in his book. In the coming episodes, we're actually going to be talking about it, but I'd completely forgotten that Druvalo talks about Sitchin's uh, 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 books and his theories, and he mentions him as a key player and someone to uh, to read up on in order to understand these things. So I just thought that was very interesting because I'd, I'd completely uh, forgotten about it. Um, but nonetheless, yes, when when we talk about these things, this is this is an interesting part because this cycle of human evolution, human consciousness, is not, according to Druvalo, is not in complete relation to our biological evolution, meaning when human consciousness is developing in, in what Druvalo is talking about, he's talking about the spiritual development, which is not necessarily or doesn't necessarily have to be tied in to the physical uh, evolution. So when we're talking about these subjects, we're not necessarily talking about what we know as human history, because that pertains only to, you know, the fossil evidence that we've found, which is talking about the uh, human body's evolution, as it were. But when Druvalo is talking about these subjects, we're also talking about the alternate dimensions that we've mentioned, where there is a spiritual evolution of consciousness, which is in a way happening outside of or separately from the physical body. Obviously, they are connected. As we mentioned, we need the brain to be as sophisticated a biological machine in order to be able to uh, um, to enclose, to inhabit the uh, the consciousness of a human. But nonetheless, those two um, uh, paths of evolution, those two branches of very different evolution, the spiritual and the biological, are, are not uh, connected in this diagram, as it were. It is in the sense that when we have a body in this current time, we are still going through our spiritual uh, evolution. But here we're talking specifically about consciousness, and that pertains to the spiritual side, whereas the physical evolution of the body um, is, is a different subject matter. And that obviously is what Sitchin was talking about uh, a lot more. So I hope that answers more or less. Um, it's ascending, perhaps it means we want new ourselves. Ah, yes. Well, we, Drumfalo is a wonderful person to read because basically his what you what we get from what he's saying is that right now we are doing exactly what we're supposed to this tremendous chaos and upheaval and and a real mess of things that we've made over the last few thousand years is completely predictable it's the only way for us to progress and he calls this state of consciousness that we're in a stepping stone and so to go from our uh, previous level of consciousness where we were to the coming age of consciousness that we're going towards, it is absolutely necessary to be in this very, uh, very uh, chaotic midway point of uh, our consciousness right now, at least according to him. So if you, uh, if you like what he says, then he's very optimistic about it all. Um, the Sphinx was made over 26,000 years ago. That is definitely what I believe. Uh, if the astroarchaeology is to be, yes, uh, archaeoastronomy. I think it's, yeah, I think it's astrotheology and archaeoastronomy, if I'm not mistaken. But it doesn't really matter, let's face it. Oh, I haven't seen that one, Mariana. Thank you. The uh, the golden mean spiral with the different uh, yugas. Yes. Now, okay, so I should mention this again, and blah, 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 possibly, you know, I wouldn't say that this is a. a by any means the absolute truth, as you know, I don't deal with absolute truths, but Druvalo does mention, um, for those who know, there is a famous book called An Autobiography, An Autobiography of a Yogi by Pramanahansa Yogananda, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, a very influential book for me, which uh, really uh, changed my life. But um, Druvalo mentions his teacher, um, uh, Sri Yukata, I believe, and he was the one who actually gave the figures um, that he talks about. And what I believe, and this is my personal belief, but Druvalo says that the the uh, the Indians who speak about these cycles of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years have actually got it wrong 
and the cycle of the precession of the equinox is 26,000 years. I personally believe that these are simply different cycles, and as is very often the case, they share the same name. And since they share the same name, it's very easy to confuse or to say, how could you possibly reach these? Because the numbers of these cycles are very accurate, um, the meaning behind them in 432, etc. So I personally believe that there are different systems that call, you know, the different yugas, the Kali Yuga, the Dvapara Yuga, and the procession of the equinox and the one that we've spoken about is one of them. But I should mention that Drumvalo says that the uh, the other estimations, which are hundreds of thousands of years, are actually uh, all wrong. So you do it whether you like. Most uh, scientists uh, say that both of them are absolute nonsense and bear no relation. So whatever. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, Autobiography Yogi. Thank you. Yes. That, oh, wow. That book really means a lot to me. Um, History.com says four and a half thousand years. Well, four and a half thousand years is scientifically inaccurate. We don't have to talk about whether aliens build the pyramids in order to, you know, see that the science of the, the water erosion, which could only have occurred um, over 12,000 years ago. So the fact that they say four and a half thousand years is very, very good. It's, it's, it's equal to like saying, you know, it's about a hundred years old. Because like, that's, that's just not true. <laughs> And it's much easier to disprove than whether it's more than 20,000 years or more than, you know, 50,000, etc. Um, but anyway, yes, uh, which could be a mistranslation of forgot to carry the man. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah, the square root of minus one. Uh, it's just, you know, I mean, there's there's so much of this information. Anyone who gets into new age, you cannot come with the same scientific mindset where Where's the person who knows? Who's the person that I need to read who knows the absolute truth and has no mistakes? And then I'll know what's true, which science is very much like that. We have the not elected, you know, uh, professionals who are responsible with telling us the right answer and everyone else copies that right answer. And very few people are allowed to uh, challenge it. And that's fine if the answer is right. But as we've seen, sometimes they get it wrong. And in that case, uh, it's very important to be able to think for ourselves, I believe. But that's me. Anyway. Um, okay. In Egypt, they had it. Any, uh, one, uh, one, two, <laughs> yeah. um, so let's see. I think that for time... Wh how did you feel about this episode? Because I felt that in this episode, we sort of stayed on target a little more. I tried to... Uh, I've got so many subjects lined up here that we're going to get to. But I really tried to... Uh, go into it a bit more deeply. Did you feel that it was a slower pace that was sort of less interesting for you to follow or maybe it made more sense and it was easier to understand or what, uh, you didn't notice any difference? Sounds just like all the others and this is all in my head. That's probably it, isn't it? Yeah, it's usually it. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I, uh, I'm pleased that we managed to get through the procession. The, oh, we sort of ended it with the, uh, with the question there. So let me just make sure that I haven't got anything written down that I wanted to get through. Um, yeah, because we've got... Okay, so yeah, that's basically it. You know, with a few minutes that I've got left, why don't we just very quickly go over the other four points. So we were speaking about the different points on the ellipse. Uh, yeah, I've got five minutes. Excellent. Um, so the two points that are of the greatest change are the points directly after the uh, extremes. And we're at the point that's after the furthest one from the center. And there's another one after that. And then there were the other two points, which are sort of in the midway. Um, not right before the extreme, but slightly further back. And those are also times of change, but of a somewhat lesser uh, intense change. And so according to Drumvalo, the, um, the predictions, the astrological predictions that he mentions are that in this time of humanity, there's going to be a lot of very, very deep changes that are happening. And those changes aren't just sort of, you know, a change in mentality, as it were, but really a shift in consciousness in the way that humanity both perceives itself and the world. And these changes coincide or, you know, are related to um, great changes that will be happening uh, to the geology of our Earth, the magnetosphere, um, the actual makeup, the poles, um, and we're, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more in the next episode. So, 
it's it's hard to say because honestly Drew Villow was actually talking about these things in the 90s I think a lot of you know the chaos seemed to be coming even back in the 90s for some of the people who were looking you know in terms of looking at the capitalist the American dream and all those things I think you could see the cracks more or less so he managed to predict uh, to a certain extent that it was going to get more chaotic and more change um, but he definitely didn't mention corona in any way so who are you going to trust you know no <laughs> i'm joking but uh yeah so next week's episode we're actually going to be talking about the poll um the shifts of shifts in the polls and we're going to be mentioning edgar casey for those who have heard and for those who haven't um he's an interesting character that druvelo talks about a lot he actually introduced me to him or you know not introduced but uh, i came to know about him through druvelo and he's he's very very interesting it, whatever your position is as to what he's talking about it's uh he's an interesting character so that's what we're going to be talking about next week the big changes that are coming oh normal thank you very much i'm, I'm glad uh, you're enjoying it uh, is there anyone in chat that I missed? That danced the ball. I actually read your uh, messages and didn't welcome you. So thank you very much for joining, Azaria, Leonis. Welcome, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, well done, Rodan. Yes, thank you. Now, as long as you're learning something, then my job here is uh, definitely done. Uh, STEM properly covers it, but we need hive astronomy, hive astrology, or us hive mind looking up. Absolutely. I uh, I would be very... There's... Oh, I can't remember. Is it Alien Honey? Do you have the show about astrology? About spirituality, but about astrology? Or am I confusing you with someone else? I can't remember who I'm ashamed to say. It was a while ago. The Sleeping Prophet. That's the one. Yes. Um, indeed. Okay. Oh my gosh. Look at the time. We're almost done. Wow. Uh, okay. Do we have a show afterwards, Rondon? Uh, you said it last week. I always forget my name. Push no, damn it! She's the best at solving. I uh, I really enjoyed what she uh, the very very little that I caught. I'm ashamed to say that for a uh, person who's here, I uh, I don't get to listen to enough shows. I think the time difference is also a bit of a problem. So you know, yes, post up, excellent. So please make sure that you stay on for that. Starting in two minutes, wonderful, and then I believe Krim. Krim, do you have a show afterwards? Uh, after that, so stay tuned for that as well. Um, I think that's it for me. If you have any questions or comments, you're more than welcome to post them in the chat, and I upload the episodes to Hive um, to my profile. So if you want to have another listen or miss the beginning or would like to ask a question, then please feel free uh, to, to post over there. Um, me, uh, my show is every Thursday. Yep, same time next week, uh, twelve um, ten UTC. Yes, there is a schedule up in chat. You can have a look. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's a uh, UTC. Yeah, I started at ten UTC. It's now eleven UTC. Uh, I'm an hour ahead, and then in two weeks I'm going to be an hour back. So it'll be the same. That's for all of you. Um, <laughs> Yes, ah, and Krim is up X afterwards in two hours. Wonderful. Post on clad. That's that's Krim. What's post on? Post sin? Is that a, a typo or am I just being an idiot? Um, yes, oh, wonderful. Yes, I uh, have absolute uh, empathy and understanding to anyone who is uh, having trouble with the hours because I'm the same. And uh, we will do our best. Uh, but there is also the recording if you uh, miss it. Either way, um, I should really leave now. So thank you very, very much once again for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I hope I see you all in the uh, coming shows. Until then, have a great one. Bye. Bye.